Hello again everyone, it's me Matt and thank you so much for joining me on today's video. We're talking today about modern day trench warfare. Now when we think of trench warfare, traditionally we think of World War I and potentially a little bit of World War II, but of course World War I was the defining time for trench warfare and strategy and it's absolutely terrifying and I mean that in every sense of the word of thinking of being a soldier in that time period operating in trenches of World War I. And, you know, you go through exhibitions and museums and things, and I have myself, and you, it just can't even express the similarities, the reality of what those uh, young men were experiencing during that time. It's, it's terrifying. But the thing is that trenches are still extremely, extremely useful in today's modern battlefield, and they are also just as terrifying. Now, I myself, in the Canadian Armed Forces of Reservist, in the artillery, no fine well that trenches are your best friend uh, if you're coming across environments where artillery is uh, is a risk and it can save your life but the more scary thing about trench warfare is knowing that you could be encountering face to face infantry engagements armored engagements and that that trench could save your life with just a small extra bit of soil placed in one area than the other or a bit of revetment that's been reinforced somewhere else and today's video is really to reinforce that pardon the pun importance of how trenches really are not something that's going to go away and something that is literally a game changer to you as a soldier or as a serving member uh, on the battlefields of today and now if you are serving and you are in the military right now serving in of course primarily the army uh, you know that trenches are taken extremely seriously this isn't something like just digging a hole and sitting in it trenches are actually quite complex in the way that they can be produced and I came across a very fascinating video produced by the Canadian Armed Forces some time ago now the footage is fairly old uh, understandably you know this kind of video does have some moments where you're like that's yeah, a little weird but the tactics is solid and and the process and the format of trenches being produced is almost exactly the same now i want to make something very clear that i'm not a subject matter expert of trenches uh, i have uh, dug a fair amount of trenches in my life and i can safely say they're not the most enjoyable thing to do making a trench is bloody hard work i mean that in every sense of the word digging them reinforcing them defending them fighting in them living in them it's not fun. You're living in a hole, literally, uh, and producing them is a lot of manual labor and hard work. And you're going to see in this video that I'm going to go through with you some of the features and some of the principles that you must adhere to to make an effective battle trench. If you don't, you could literally lose your life. And I'm every sense of the word meaning this, that if you incorrectly place a bit of wire or a bit of you know cabling or a bit of strut or revetment or soil in the wrong place, you could die. You could be buried alive in these things. Or even worse, you know, attacked, shot at, and, and killed. Scary stuff. And that's why I really do feel like trench warfare is here to stay. And, and maybe not in the more sort of non-traditional sense, but if, you know, push come to shove and we are in traditional head-on uh, conventional warfare, trenches will be a part of your day-to-day -day routine. So you better get used to it. So let's take a look at this video and uh, go through it and learn a little bit more about the effective battle trench with the Canadian Armed Forces of the past. Now, one of the things to note here is you can see the amount of equipment these troops are carrying into this defensive location. They're setting up as a section to defend a hillside, and the section commander is going to give his various orders, set up his various defenses, and when you're in a defensive position, you don't have much time. Normally, you're preparing for a force to advance towards you. That in itself is terrifying, and the equipment that you're carrying with you is heavy. You know, ground pounders, pickaxes, shovels, that's on top of your additional equipment. I did my AGLC, and I can safely say the hardest part of the AGLC wasn't the command and control it wasn't the fitness and stuff it was the one like death march i had to do with the amount of heavy equipment you needed to carry with you to a defensive location uh extra ammunition need as much ammunition as you can uh all defense stores are heavy and they're hard work to use and to carry and if you're not fit enough to to work with those tools you need to work on it now so get used to operating shovels pickaxes and ground thumpers Here, the section commander begins by assigning trench positions.
He then validates the distance between the trenches. Now, I'm certainly not going to preach the choir here and make out like I'm some infantryman who digs trenches every single day, and that's my bread and butter. But I do know that being involved with a number of defensive positions throughout my training and time, that this is really important. Positioning of where your trenches are is critical, either for arcs of fire, communication, defensive capability, uh, or spread from artillery attack, right? If you have indirect fire coming to your position and, and spaced in a very weird configuration, either too tight or too far apart, you're going to have problems. You need to be able to communicate with one another as trenches. If you have comms, then good. If you don't, then sometimes it's down to just shouting across from the other trench. And, you know, spacing and positioning of the trenches is absolutely vital. And that's why, you know, the section commander has to review this. And it can take time. Sometimes you'll be halfway through digging your trench. And, you know, the section commander or the platoon sergeant is going to be like, yep, yeah, change the plan. This didn't work out. We need to move you. That can be frustrating. Don't let it beat you down. You know, at the end of the day, it's there to protect you. If you're going into a real war situation, you don't want to be complaining about having to move your trench 20 feet to the left or to the right. Uh, at the end of the day, they're doing it for a specific reason. People make mistakes. And yes, it's tiring digging half a trench and having to start again, but it is what it is. Next, he confirms the arcs of fire. Then indicates the alarm positions, the track plan, and shows where to dispose of the soil and get the construction materials. Now, while one soldier watches for enemy movement, the other begins to dig, starting with the fire trench. So a point to add here, uh, it looks like the terrain they're in is fairly mossy or spongy and a little sandy, but sometimes you'll be asked to dig trenches in environments where the ground is absolutely hard packed. Uh, clay, nasty thick clay, if it's really cold out you're going to get maybe some frost on there too. It makes it a lot harder. Don't fight it. Take turns, work as a team, as buddies. If you need to, you know, have a good water break here and there. There's no point in you absolutely exhausting yourself digging this trench if you're not able to fight the battle if things kick off, right? And that's one thing I le learned on AGLC or my uh, junior leadership course that I did with Canadian Armed Forces is I was digging like a machine, but I found towards the end of the day at my defensive location, I was running out of steam for the actual battle that was about to potentially commence. So take your time, work as buddies, work as a team and dig it efficiently. Uh, work smarter, not harder sometimes. That's how it works with things like digging rough trenches. It's important to eliminate any trace of the digging that could alert the enemy to their position. So this kind of reinforces the point I made at the beginning of this video. The trenches are not just a simplistic hole in the ground. There's some technicality behind it. The way in which you shape them, the way in which you dig them into a certain uh, depth or a certain width or a certain height and the way in which you dispose of soil and camouflage around it. If you just dug a hole and spread soil everywhere, that's exactly what you're just doing. You're digging a hole. There's a difference between digging a trench and digging a hole, because trenches have tactical capability, whether it be, you know, hiding that topsoil is important. If you have a patrol that's coming through your area, and that triple outnumber you as a force, uh, there may be instances where you may not actually want to engage them. If your camouflage and have set your trenches up correctly, you may actually be able to let them go by you, uh, report them so that you can bring in a fire mission later on. It's really critical that you get rid of that topsoil and try and keep the area that you're disposing soil of clean and tidy so it looks natural. Because if you just create this messy dug-in fire position, it's just going to be A, easily spotted from the air, and B, easily spotted from optics, from vehicles, or by foot if the ground forces are coming to your location. Of course, as a defensive point, you're basically the standoff. You shouldn't even be letting troops go through your lines, and normally you wouldn't. But in the sense of making sure you're protecting yourself as much as possible, you'd be surprised at how much, you know, sand from above can be seen in disturbing from a trench position being dug. So you have to dispose of it carefully and as neatly as possible. 
The trench, which measures 2 meters long by 0.75 meters wide, is now deep enough to provide basic protection to a soldier lying flat on his stomach. So there you have it. This is stage one as a fire trench for your buddy and you to individually get into. It's short, slim, and allows you to just get minimum protection. Before going any further, the fields of fire must be clear. Once that's been done, the digging of the trenches continues to provide the section with even greater protection. At approximately 1.4 meters deep, just below the arms, the trench makes it possible to maintain a defensive position for several days. So this is the stage 2 trench. It's a lot of hard work to get it to this stage. It is roughly 0.75 meters wide, 1.4 meters deep, and 2 meters long. Time permitting, the trench is widened and an elbow rest is added. This will allow the soldiers to use their weapons more effectively. Now you would be amazed at how much of a difference this makes to your firing position or firing from a trench. You'd think that having the trench just as a 90 degree angle would be fine to fire across, but I can tell you it's not. It doesn't feel comfortable, you don't get a natural point of aim, it affects your firing position very heavily with just a small half a foot chop into the soil in front of you gives you a really nice stable firing position it also gives you places to put maybe some spare ammo your range card your radios things like this it's really really helpful i can't express how much it is important to focus on making that ledge perfect for you and your fire partner and they keep working installing revetment to shore up the walls of the trenches Another point to add here, you can see this soldier, he's got uh, bare hands manhandling and manipulating this revetment. Guys, if you have gloves, wear them. This stuff can slice your hands open within a second. It really can. And if this stuff slips on you, you're going to have a pretty deep wound on your hand. I've seen it happen. Please be careful. Use your gloves. That's what they're there for. Uh, some gloves are protecting better than others normally if you can get the sort of the leather or sort of Kevlar protected style gloves, they're more handy to do this kind of work, especially when later on you're going to be working with things like low wire entanglements, barbed wire, razor wire, things like that, concertina wire. Have gloves on you when you're digging this kind of stuff and making it. Uh, revetment's important because you don't want this stuff falling in on you from the sides. Now, my engineer buddies, Chimo, uh, they are the pros at this. They build trenches as part of their, you know, it's part of their bread and butter, same as the infantry. But the engineers, Chimo, really do have the skills to set up these trenches very, very effectively. I got some really cool uh, tips and tricks from the engineers. So if you have those subject matter expertise people on courses with you or around you or in your battalion, your brigade, company, regiment, whatever it may be, ask them questions. Use that experience because all that experience and those little tips and tricks for things like revetment if you're bending it in the right way and slotting it in the right place it makes your life so much easier i can't express that enough you know you're fighting this metal stuff trying to bend it and get it into the right way engineers especially have that expertise to say hey bend it this way put it at this angle measure it this length slot it in here to make your trench very good for your life and also for you for your sanity at this point, then, we call it a phase three trench. You've put your revetment in, you put in your stakes, and you've given yourself that ledge to fire from. At this point, soldiers are generally assigned to add complementary protection, installing barbed wire. So barbed wire and concertina wire are your friend. Although when you're setting it up, you don't feel like it is as much. It's very, very useful for your defensive position. It's a hindrance to the enemy. It really does slow them down. It's a pain in the ass to try and work through, but it's also a pain in the ass to set up. It really is. As you can see, these troops have got those leather gloves on. You're going to need them. One tip I will definitely add to this is if you have things like waterproofs on or clothing that could get ripped or torn by this stuff when you're setting it up very easily, get it off. Okay, wear something that's a lot less worryable if it gets torn or ripped because you will at some point get this stuff snagged on something and your waterproofs is not something you want to have holes in that's going to get you wet and soaking later on. Same thing for your equipment. Secure it, tie it away. Try not to let this stuff get tangled onto you when you're trying to deploy it because it's just a nightmare. And again, your energy will be low from digging trenches. This will be additional tasks that the section will be given concurrently sometimes to when you're digging the trench. So it's almost a bit of a reprieve from having to dig the trench, but it's just as much much difficulty and and effort and strenuous work than it is digging so just be careful when you're setting up the wire So 
So again, I'm not a subject matter expert here, but I can safely say setting up defensive positions is absolutely exhausting. It is so tiring. And when you're the potential person who's going to be setting up explosives at the defensive positions, you really need to take your time and, and focus. Uh, try and you know set yourself up if you're going to set this thing up to the most energetic or the most uh, you know I guess refreshed soldier that's on the line because setting this stuff up can kill you or those around you if it's not done properly. One little mistake and boom, it's all over. So you don't want the most sleep deprived, you know, physically exhausted troop setting up claymores on your perimeters or at your defensive location if they're just not with it. Something just to consider for those section commanders, two ICs, when you're sort of doing the more intricate deadly stuff that could occur be cautious of your your manpower and look at the resources you have and say does it make sense me sending someone out there to go put the claymores up and landmines or whatever else if they're absolutely pooped uh they're gonna have a really tough time doing that so you know focus on that it's important and that doesn't just apply for setting up explosives resources for anything right setting up extra defenses try and rotate those people through so they're becoming fresh and fresh and fresh and getting you know the things they need to do we still need to eat drink uh, sleep in the routine defensive positions take a long time to set up uh, even the smaller ones so just something to consider <laughs> Set up trip flares. Now, this may sound a little cliche and weak of me to say, but setting up a defensive location is horrifyingly scary. Uh, even in a training scenario, it is. It can be an, a not true fear. Of course, in a real war situation, you're going to be in true fear. But even in a training scenario, you know at some point someone's trying to come get you whether it be sneak through your lines to steal you from the middle of the night with an op 4 force or opposition force, or, you know, just the staff that are training you, messing around with you. It's, it's, it's terrifying because you're always on edge. You're tired, you're exhausted, you know someone's coming to get you. You are not the one in charge here. They are, right? The enemy is in charge. They can choose to or not choose to come get you. You're pretty much locked into a location for the most part. You're not going anywhere. You have been told to hold this location, whether it be to the death or to the training death, you're going to stay there, right? And that can be really scary on the mind, mentally thinking that I'm setting up this trip flare to prevent someone in the middle of the night coming to potentially kill me, right? Or my buddy or the rest of my fire team or my section or whoever else, right? Setting up these defenses and watching this kind of video just reinforces to me the the mental and psychological effect defensive positions have on you. And of course, you know, the enemy that would be coming towards your defensive location would have the same psychological effect because they know they're walking into somewhat of a trap they are prepared for, like they've set everything up for them to be engaged upon. But as a defensive location, normally if you're in a defensive you're going to be overwhelmed. There's going to be a larger force coming for you than you for them because that's how it works. It's normally a three to one ratio of going to kill someone in the armed forces. Again, I'm not a subject matter expert. I'm not infantry. I'm not armored. And I'm not, uh, you know, engineers. I'm in the artillery. But I do know that if you're in a defensive, most of the time it's because you've been told to hold the ground. Someone is coming to get you. And this eerie, creepy music in this video just kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies because I'm like... If there was a real war scenario in trench warfare and you actually had to do this, I would be in an emotional state. I mean, we're all brave, but it's it's soul destroying knowing that they're coming for you, right? Install sound and motion detectors. Now, I've never seen uh, noise or motion detecting equipment on the front line with trenches before or in any configuration, honestly. Uh, in Afghanistan, we had perimeter defenses and fences and didn't have anything like this. It would have been pretty cool. Uh, whenever I think of something like this, I just think of aliens with the harpy or motion detecting system or the uh, sentry guns. You know, it's a fa fa fantastic scene off Aliens, by the way. Yeah, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. But in trench capability, we're not going to be having xenomorphs coming towards us. We're going to have human beings. And uh, this kind of technology would be quite handy, but also quite deceptive against things that could cause false readings or false reports, such as wildlife, etc., or the weather that can also interfere with these kind of things. So this is, uh, you know, pretty interesting. I didn't think you would see this in some of the older footage, but it's out there. Clearly it exists, but I just don't know if it still has much use in today's battlefield. Knowing that they have time, 
the soldiers continue to work on their trenches to ensure maximum protection from enemy attack. So at this point, you can see the trench has developed significantly. They now have a uh, small little hide on the uh, side of the trench there to actually get into. Uh, they've set up their ledge. They've camouflaged the area. Most of the topsoil has been removed or dispersed elsewhere. They have a camnet that they can pull over themselves for aerial warning. You know, if there's someone flying over, they can pull those camnets over and make it even more difficult to uh, to be seen. Because, of course, there's no way of getting around the actual trench itself, for the most part, being still that sandy color. So that camnet can just be quickly whipped over the top. They get into the trench if there's an aerial attack or aerial uh, reconnaissance occurring. But you can see now just, you know, how much effort goes into making this. And you think, man, it's just digging a trench, filling a hole with some sandbags and some steel and you know, moving some soil away, but if you've just done on a long road march or whatever else, and you've just been in a section attack, and then you're asking to be set up defensive positions, it's hard work, but you'll be very grateful once you have it, uh, because it's a place that you can eat and rest, and, and, you know, honestly, you get to know your battle partner or your fire team partner very well in these trenches, and you have to, because you're relying upon each other to save each other's life if things really do go sour. At this stage, they widen the fire trench to 2.4 meters at one end increasing the depth to two meters. They also add the revetment and 0.5 meters of packed earth. This provides optimal overhead protection from artillery fire, mortars, and other projectiles exploding in the trees or overhead. Now when you look at this diagram or the cutaway of the trench, you see that there's not a huge amount of topsoil or sandbags covering uh, the troops in this little uh, compartment here. And if you were to take a direct artillery strike to the top, you know, around actually imploding this area, of course, the trench, you're not going to be able to stop that, okay? The, the blast from a HE, even a 105, or even some smaller mortars uh, is going to cause major issues. But you'd be surprised at how much uh, that soil and those sandbags can withstand for the blast radius of nearby explosions from artillery rounds or projectiles and you know when it's raining it's nice to have that cover if necessary for one of your troops not to get absolutely soaked you can do rotations of sentry uh, normally if you're in a position you should be rotating so you can rest and, and get some sleep but as many guns downrange is really the kind of key here you want to be monitoring the front but it's nice to just have a little recluse you know you can go in there it's not exactly comfortable you're certainly not going to be standing up in there or laying down in it it's going to be sort of sitting or squatting kneeling and just taking a little breather you know get some food down your neck uh, I have some water and then come back out into the fire pit and, and do what you need to do. But all that revetment, all that uh, staking, all that, you know, manipulation of that revetment takes time. It's really hard work. All those sandbags have got to get filled. So you can see the more and more equipment that you've got to, you know, have with you. Of course, normally the engineers drop off all the revetment. You're not going to be carrying 30 sheets of or 40 sheets of revetment steel with you, stainless steel. But these are the kind of things uh, you need to consider, right? Is this the stuff that you're going to be needing to bring into the field? At this point, though, your trench should be pretty much set up for the stage four trench. This is what it looks like, and this is where it needs to be set up in the depths and the lengths of what you want it to be. The addition of this easy-to-remove overhead cover will further shield them from the heat of nuclear weapons and inclement weather. It will also help conceal the trench from the air. At this point with stage five, you're basically just adding additional features that are going to make your life a lot easier. The overhead cover, overhead protection that can be deployed, uh, grenades, sums, ammo pits, just really kind of spicing up the space to make it work better for you, whether it be in the defensive capability. Uh, grenade sums are very useful to have. There's a grenade thrown in your trench. You can throw it into the sort of uh, downspout. And then you also have water drainage. So you create drainage pits for the water to get into. Uh, and that leads us really into stage six. So you make, you know, your grenade sumps. Uh, and your drainage pit to allow you to really live in this for the long term and have a little bit more comfort than you would in some of the lower stages of the trench. You can also put an ammunition pit in your undercover as well. So that's pretty much it, folks. Uh, you know, setting up a trench is hard work. It's a lot of hard work, but it's rewarding. Uh, unfortunately, if you are being engaged by the king of battle, the artillery, then, you know, sometimes it's just not going to help you at all because the artillery is always going to win the battle in the end. Just kidding. Uh, but it's seriously, though, you know, trenches are a huge factor of being defending against artillery and supporting yourselves on the battlefield and if you do have to dig trenches in the future i feel sorry for you i apologize that you have to be involved in that but it's part of the core business and being in the army 
that's what we do. We're ground pounders. We have to uh, use the ground to our advantage, literally. I hope you enjoyed today's video and learned something from it. If you did enjoy, please leave me a like. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future, please click the little bell by the subscribe button. Also, if you want to support my Patreon or PayPal, I would really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who has been supporting me, both financially and in any terms of contributions towards, say, my fan mailbox. Check the description box below also for any of my social media platforms. Hope you have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.